Hello everyone and welcome back to Water Child Tarot or welcome if this is your first time. Thank you for joining me and we're back today with a, another Japanese deck and this one is a particular oddity um, that I'm excited to share with you. Um, there's lots of overlap, there's lots of intrigue and um, you'll see what I mean uh, in just a second when we get into the booklet especially. Um, I'm going to offer you some translations uh, on this one, so this video might run a little bit longer than some of my other straight walkthroughs, but hopefully it'll be interesting for you and be worthwhile. So let's get right into it. All right, so I want to start off by um, mentioning that I did look online to see if anyone else had done an in-depth review of this deck, and I found one on the Zen Witches channel. Um, her name is Luna. And um, she had a version of this deck. It was just one that came in a tuck box. So she didn't have any of this extra packaging or a booklet. Um, so I'm excited to dive into that a little bit. But I will put a link to her channel um, below this one um, so that you can see her video. Um, she points out some interesting um, correspondences or uh, similarities between this certain cards in this deck and a book um, that she has on witchcraft, so I'll mention those as well. Um, it does come packaged in another, at least one other format with a gold box, and it's actually known under two titles. So it's called the Tarot of Wicca, um, and that's what we can see on the title card, which I'll show you in just a second, but it's also known as the Secret Tarot and the Tarot of the Witch's House. So I'm going to call it the Terra of Wicca because that's the English title that's printed prominently on the packaging, but you might come across this in other uh, contexts with a different title. It's all the same deck. It's not to be confused with the um, Tarot of Witches, which is the, the one that was used in the James Bond film, um, and it's a completely different deck. It's not to be confused with any other Wiccan or Pagan or Witch-themed um, decks. It is, it is really its own thing. And I can tell you that uh, what the box says. So I've done a little bit of translation here. So on the front it says Secret Tarot Card. And then down here it says Alexandria Jupiter King. And this text is what first got me interested in this uh, deck when I saw it online because that um, author's name is also in common with the famous J.K. Waite, or Jupiter King uh, tarot deck. This was the first RWS-themed tarot deck published in Japan, and it's a completely redrawn version of the uh, Rider Waite Smith deck. I've done a number of videos on my channel featuring this one. So looking around and seeing that um, Alexandria Jupiter King is a very well-known fortune-telling te teacher and author, um, he uh, wrote many booklets and was involved in the production, apparently, of many different decks in Japan, probably over 20 or 30. I've seen um, all different ones, uh, all different styles, in fact, um, published with his name attached. And whether he was really the conceptual um, author behind every single one, I don't know. But I think in a lot of cases, like Stuart Kaplan or like Rachel Pollack or Mary Kay Greer, a lot of these folks are asked to, to, once they have a name and reputation, they're asked to write the booklet and be a guest author for a lot of uh, artwork that comes out. So he's a prominent figure, probably the, the best known fortune telling um, and tarot teacher in the country. Um, so that's the front of the box. Um, the back of the box is amusing actually. So here's where we got the the intriguing mention here of US Games. So US Games must have been uh, involved in the production of this deck in some way. I'm not exactly sure how. Um, but the translation of this part uh, here, it says more on sale and boom around the world. <laughs> so it's obviously, you know, just that kind of general promotional speak, like amazing tarot deck, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but it's just pretty funny seeing it translated in a slightly different way. Uh, the spine of the box also mentions Alexandria Jupiter King's name, and it says, the future fortune telling with three gorgeous colors. So 
that's that's the packaging it does come uh, my version didn't come in a tuck box it came in this funky wallet and it opens this way and then the cards slot in here so um, it's a little bit better wallet than some other decks that I have where there's no internal structure to hold the cards in place but it's still not my preferred um, type of packaging but you can see that these two things then look like books and then they slide into that outer case so that's how that goes together let's um, take a look at the title card on the deck and also talk about the booklet here so there's not a lot of information about this deck out there in the world um, there are two sources that I often will consult on rare and unusual decks and the first is the alchemy website by Adam McLean and he does have an entry for this deck there. There's also an entry on the uh, now defunct but still available eclectic uh, tarot forums. So I'll link to both of those um, in the description box below so you can read those entries. So here's our deck. It is glossy coated so I have to be a little careful with my lighting so that you can actually see the images. So here's our deck and I will zoom in when we get to the actual flip through um, but I just want to show you the title card for the moment. This does credit everyone uh, involved in the production. So we have illustrated by H. Kitagawa 1983 and then we have under the direction of A. Mokuseo and this is Alexandria Mokuseo, Alexandria Jupiter King. And the production is by Shaitosha and or Sitosa. And this publisher also published a number of standalone books on tarot reading by Alexandria Jupiter King. So this was, you know, uh, the writer to um, Alexandria Jupiter King's weight or the U.S. Games to his Stuart Kaplan. Um, it was that kind of close relationship with repeated publications over time. The booklet itself um, looks like this. It has a picture of the Empress card on the front. Um, she's called the Mother in this deck, and we'll get more into that in just a second. Uh, I had, didn't bother to translate the cover here, um, but I did look at translating some of the inside of the booklet. Um, it does read the opposite way, so um, and this is the back of the book. And it reads the opposite way that we would read in the West because Japanese is read in the opposite direction. So this is the front. And here in the front, we can see um, in color a bunch of different decks that were also available, you know, from, I would say, released from the seventh through the 70s into the 80s that were concurrent with this deck. Um, not all of them are U.S. Games productions, so I feel that... Um, Alexandria Jupiter King and or Stuart Kaplan were just trying to let uh, folks in the Japanese market know what um, decks were out there. It was kind of an advertising and like current tarot awareness. Um, but you can see all the titles are down here um, in Japanese and in English, so that's helpful. And I, I actually recognize quite a few. I have, um, I have had a copy of the Richard Gardner here, this top one. I do um, have a, a new production of the David Sheridan uh, deck. So, but there's all kinds, all different styles. We've got Egyptian decks. We've got um, Kab Kabbalistic uh, decks. Here's the Mayan tarot, the Zoltan tarot um, that's still available today. Um, we have some various uh, types of Marseille decks down here. So all sorts of interesting, interesting oddities. Uh, but these were all ones that were some somehow or other available in Japan at the time. Uh, and maybe this is to promote some things that A.G. Mueller was uh, printing, who was the printing house for U.S. Game at, games at the time. I'm not exactly sure of how the relationship was was working here. And as I'm showing you all of these uh, decks that are advertised in the front of the book, I also wanted to mention that there are a number of decks that seem to randomly appear uh, in this book. Like, I don't know what um, this is, but it's got the Lord of Earned Success, so I'm thinking it's a Golden Dawn or Thoth-based um, deck that I'm just not familiar with, if you know what that, that card is. The one that caught my eye, though, was this one. Um, it says Nuovo Tarocco Luguti Piemontese, and I think that's a, it's Lugari, uh, so that's a, um, uh, a typo, 
Um, but I recognize this uh, deck. I recognize the title and this card because I actually own a copy of it. So this is a deck that was released in 1982. So the same year that um, this book and this deck were being put together, um, or, or or the year before. So very contemporary. If this is 83, um, it's just one year later. And this is an art deck. It's a modern um, deck in an old Piemontese style from an Italian artist who is um, who's still alive and well today, um, M. Guernacia. And I'm going to do a video about this deck um, as a separate item uh, here on the channel. But I just wanted to sort of put this in here. So, you know, it's not all U.S. Games decks that are mentioned in the booklet, even though um, this Terra of Wicca is a U.S. Games production. Um, this, uh, you know, this booklet has a bunch of other decks in it. So it's almost like a miniature version of the Encyclopedia of Tarot in that way, um, because it mentions a ton of uh, decks that are really unrelated to what this is, but it's just kind of telling you that these decks exist, that they're out there. And, you know, it also has a ton of spreads um, in the back. So it gives you a bunch of, I guess, unrelated uh, general tarot information. Um, and you can just tell this just by looking at the pictures, really. Um, but yeah, so I just, I thought that was a weird, for me, a weird tie-in. It's like, oh, and here's this deck that has nothing to do with Japanese culture or even well-known tarot history, I would say. This, this deck is not as well-known as a lot of other uh, decks are from the time period, and yet it's in the booklet for that one. So I just wanted to add that in. Now we're going to get into the translation, um, and I'm not going to translate too much of this deck, but I'll, I'll give you a, a bit of it. Um, here we can have... So this is where I got 1986 from, but... The copyright is Mokuseo, 1983. So this was developed in 1983, possibly, and then published in 86. Um, but the translation of this text here reads, Alexandria Jupiter King, an internationally known tarot fortune teller, uh, tarot in Japan fortune telling and magical authority, school of Wu. Um, he runs the fortune, fortune telling house, the witch's house, written by many books, Priest of the Church of Wicca. So I apologize, the translation's a little funky, but um, you know, this is how it's coming out. Uh, it says the location of the Wicca house, the witch's house. So these three bullet points here give you an uh, address of three different places where you could um, buy tarot decks, um, where Alexandria Jupiter King had these affiliated bookshops, essentially occult bookshops. One in Osaka, uh, one in Kobe City, um, which is, I know, where he was from originally, um, and then one in Kitakyushu. Um, I'm not sure that where that last city is. I'll have to look that up. Um, it says, note, the witch's house is a fortune-telling house. Various inquiries I cannot respond to. All questions are to the following. Uh, inquiries, tarot, and magical supplies, lo log billing address, um, and then a, an address where you can write and, I guess, get your questions answered or maybe mail order things from the witch's house. So I'm just going to quickly um, read the translation of these two pages. So this, this first page here and then this one. Right, so the first page begins. Uh, first, we will deliver a new tarot card and special introductory goods. A series of this book with cards, a set of books, but the regular tarot is the first, with an original design, a tarot with a modern American accent. I am convinced that it is a masterpiece and can be proud in the world. How is the impression of the card? Tarot is also changing in its long history. America with bold interpretations and designs centered around, and we are entering an era of new tarot. So he's picking up on this movement, you know, if this is the early 80s that this is coming out, this um, interest in tarot and the occult um, and the kind of new age self-development aspect of tarot um, has really exploded in the West. And so he's picking up on that. At this time, the introductory book has reduced the number of information pages and actually used a lot of fortune telling. 
If you're interested, please read Tarot Fortune Telling, published by the same publisher, Shaitosa, or Shaitosha, uh, in the same series. The, the intent of this book is to be correct and gentle, and to be able to do actual fortune telling. Recently, it has become quite popular with junior high students, and is said to be the first to know the existence of tarot, since many people are seen, the contents are easy to understand, and are explained practically. If you read it over and over again, you can become a master of fortune telling. The fortune telling, uh, the number of years of examination age and educational background are not relevant. Amateur uh, and professional fortune teller, uh, there is no difference. Some high school students, such as the author, show an amazing hit rate, saying this kind of person person is fortune telling. So he's he's saying that basically young people might have a natural talent for this. You don't necessarily have to be very experienced in order to give good readings, uh, which is interesting. And then on the second page of the introduction, we just have a little bit more here. So it says, it's wonderful to be a teacher. The easiest way to master fortune telling is to quote, know your future and get in touch with friends and lovers, end quote. Uh, tarot will be the first. However, in the divination where inspiration is the decisive factor, is it, a, it is important to have a beautiful and mysterious card with a beam image. So I guess for the, for the images to be um, you know, stimula stimulating to the imagination, that's kind of how I interpret that. Um, in that respect, I am proud that the Terror of the Witch's House attached to this book is the best. Uh, all of our fortune teller members who use this tarot uh, that was created at the time said inspiration is a side and it shows an unprecedented astonishing hit rate by all means I would like everyone to use it for actual fortune telling and let us know the result tarot is a deep and mysterious world I will continue to publish these introductory books and cards I will go ahead I want to be with you without following alone so this entry I wrote signed Alexandria Jupiter King um, and all this stuff about how this is a true fortune telling deck, etc., plays out once we get to the descriptions. So this doesn't talk necessarily about um, archetypes or the roles of the characters in our lives or that kind of thing. It really gives you um, just sort of textbook divinatory meanings for each of the cards. And we'll see that. I'm going to give you a little bit more translation as we go. I know this can be kind of tedious if we do. Um, too much of it, but let's zoom in. So here's our fool, and there's definitely a mix of imagery in here. We get some um, sort of pagan or Wiccan imagery. We get some Egyptian imagery. Um, it's a it's, it's quite a mix as we go through. But I like this fool. Um, I like uh, the headgear here. You don't often see that in decks um, in terms of representation of different cultures. Even in Egyptian uh, decks, I don't often see someone wearing like a headscarf or a turban. Here's our magician. All right, so here we have the High Priestess, and this is one of the cards that um, Luna, over at Zen Witch Channel, and I'll link to her video on this deck, um, she points out that this uh, is basically a copy out of a book that she has called A Witch's Bible Complete. Um, and you know shows you the examples from there so there's a couple of cards in this deck that seem to be lifted right out of there um, not just in the you know the way that the models or po are posed or the symbols um, that are associated with them but the actual people that are modeling um, in that in that book so that's interesting possibly a bit strange <laughs> but interesting the other thing that she points out and that I agree with is that a lot of the um, proportions and features um, of the people in this deck are very strange um, they're kind of out of whack they're sort of out of proportion or um, a lot of the people look sort of masculine and feminine at the same time or a bit and um, oddly androgynous I would say um, and I don't mean to be um, critical of people who are, you know, non-binary or that kind of thing, but you'll just see that it's it's a little bit weird the way that's represented here. I don't think it's intentional. I don't think this is like a trans positive deck or anything like that. Um, I just think that maybe the artist was not quite up to the task of drawing people. And, you know, drawing humans is really difficult. It's, it's hard to make them look realistic. 
So because uh, Luna spent a little bit of time on this card in her video, I thought I'd offer a translation as well. So let me grab and I'll just read you what I got off of my automatic translator software. It says, within the witch's organization, the chief priestess actually performs the ritual. Uh, it doesn't say what ritual she's performing. Um, in this painting, the chief priestess poses in the Osiris position during the ceremony. It is a copy of the place. There is a book that translates the title of High Priestess into High Priestess, but I think the chief priestess is correct. So he, he favors favors the, the term chief priestess over high priestess. Uh, the moon crown on its head symbolizes the moon goddess. Um, and then we get some divinatory meanings. So it refers to meaningful knowledge and deep thoughts in the case of a normal position, a well-educated woman, a woman who is not profane, um, a university student, a graduate student after becoming a member of a society or getting married, and then entering the university again for religion, philosophy, a cult, or to learn magic, to be baptized or enter a monastery, has the spiritual power to see things with, intu with intuition, deep research, refers to an unmarried woman, a virgin woman without injury, change rebellious spirit, and then reversal meanings. Um, we would say a, high, a big mistake, um, the missing woman, a woman with high conceit and pride, uh, to put on headgear. This card could indicate difficulty, a narrow field of view, ignorance, non-learning, criticism, misphobia, being caught up in frantic conventions, like conventional thinking, I think, um, drawn to something strange, mental instability, drop out of college or high school, false educational background, or halfway through your, your goal. So, um, you know, it's kind of a mix of what the, what the person as the high priestess represents, but also what the card could give you as a fortune in a fortune telling type reading. And again, the, you know, the automatic translation is a little clunky and I apologize, but it's sort of the best I can do because um, I don't read Japanese. All right, so moving on, um, we'll go through the rest of the majors. Here's our mother card, our empress. The emperor, the fourth card is the conqueror. Oh, and I want to interrupt myself and quickly point out. Um, so 22 card readings, majors only readings are very popular in Japan. <laughs> a lot of decks are only published with the 22 major cards anyway. They don't have the pips. But here you can see that that's what this a previous owner used this deck for because I have it in order and the majors are stained and the other ones are more pristine. So clearly they had pulled the majors out separately to work with them uh, more than the deck as a whole. I've seen this on other decks I've gotten from Japan too, so it seems like a pretty common um, way to use tarot. Even if even if it was a complete deck, they didn't use all the cards necessarily. All right, so that's we're back to our emperor, the conqueror. I like his uh, scimitar. If we're going to be having these sort of Egyptian and um, North African themes, it's nice to see a a correct weapon for the time period. Although. This guy looks awfully European. I mean, look at his blue eyes and his, you know, lighter colored hair. Um, so, yeah, definitely a weird mishmash. Here's a very creepy high priest. I'm going to move on from him quickly because he actually does give me the creeps. Um, here's the lovers. Uh, they don't look super happy to be together. Uh, this guy looks like a 70s porn star to me. <laughs> and she just looks miffed. Um but they're, I guess they're under, you know, the tree of life or they're in the Garden of Eden or something, but with their 70s, you know, jewelry on. Yeah, pretty funny. Uh, here's the chariot. He's got an Egyptian, I know this probably has some name, but this is like a falcon or uh, some kind of bird symbol that you see a lot in Egyptian um, artifacts and artwork. Strength card, this is one of our weird bodies that's not quite proportional. Um, not quite pronounced male or female. It's it's um, 
It's very weird. The torso and the arms especially are very, very small in comparison with the, the size of the buttocks and the leg. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. It's a better drawing of a person than I could do, I'll tell you that. Our Hermit card. I like this card because it has more scenery than a lot of the others do. But I gotta say, still with the creepy face. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> Our Wheel of Fortune. Pretty classical uh, example of the Wheel of Fortune with the signs of the zodiac going around. Again, Justice with a weird body um, and, and a weird pose, too. <laughs> like, here's my butt. <laughs> Our Hanged Man. Let's check out the face. Well drawn. Looks like um, possibly North African person. The way the hair and the the features are. That's interesting. I hadn't noticed that before. I had been looking at this deck. Here's Death. Um, and interesting that Death is behind storm clouds and over a field of wheat. as almost as if they are going to bring in that crop for us. Temperance. Relatively normal looking card by comparison. The Devil card, here's where I'd like to make another comparison to a different Japanese deck, because as I was going through this one, getting it set up, I went, ooh, that reminded me of something. So uh, not too long ago, I did a walkthrough, a comparative walkthrough featuring this deck. This is the Tarot Uranai, the Your Fortune Tarot. This one was published in the late 80s, so it would have been published, you know, six or seven or eight years after um, our Tarot of Wicca was originally published. The artwork is this kind of um, cartoony sort of um, line drawing. You know, it's not the collage or the photorealistic uh, art that we get into our Tarot of Wicca. And it's mostly based on the artwork from the J.K. Waite um, Tarot. But I thought the Devil card was very interesting because it features this same kind of guy in a black skull cap with the little stubby horns coming out um, and the upside down pentagram on in gold on his chest so I had to I had to share that observation there even the way that these figures now that I look at this a little more closely these figures have their arms kind of straight down by their sides and it's the same thing for the figures in the background here so um, I don't know if that's coincidental or not. Maybe this is just part of the cultural lexicon of what devil cards should look like um, at this time period in Japan. But I'm I'm wondering if maybe this deck, which came later and clearly cribbed from other um, other decks by Alexandria Jupiter King, might have also cribbed from this particular card as well. So. Here we have the Thunderbolt instead of the Tower, and I always like this nod to uh, older historic tarots where you had a Thunderbolt um, or the Lightning. So we have a Star card. This is another one that uh, Luna draws a um, comparison with to um, her book on witchcraft. The moon, I love a celestial moon, a photorealistic moon. Um, and then we have the sun, also photorealistic sun. To me, the, the celestial cards don't really need a lot of dressing up. It's okay to just have the moon, the stars, the sun. Here's judgment. And some of these look like they might be, you know, actors from the 1980s. I can't, I couldn't tell you exactly which ones, but they just, they have these like 70s and 80s haircuts and clothing and stuff like that. I do like the pink hair on our world card here. That's pretty cool. And again, I apologize for some of the glare, but it is what it is. All right, so here's our eights of wands with our um, Kabbalistic tree of life represented here. Um, funny that they 
you know, they put a bunch of symbols over here and then none on this side. And I don't know enough about Kabbalah and Kabbalistic symbolism to be able to tell you why that might be. And you'll see that the um, pip cards don't have the number of items um, in in the pips. So the ace has a single wand, but so do all the other uh, wands cards. We're not going to get two wands, three wands, four wands. We just get a single one with some kind of uh, background. This looks like the horned god um, mounted in effigy on a coin dangling from a chain. Four of wands with two candles. So it's quite stark. Most of the cards are quite stark. Five of wands, we do get a couple of figures here. over a sunrise, I guess. Seven. As Luna points out, this figure is very strange. It has no genitals. Sort of looks more masculine than feminine. Um, and it kind of has this like nod to being um, some kind of pagany figure, you know, green man or something like that with the fern uh, headdress, but yeah, very strange. The Eight of Wands shows us a waterfall in the background, which, you know, sort of speaks to like the powerfulness of the Eight of Wands, the kind of driving force, I guess, if you think about the RWS cards. Let's just read what the um, translation of this can offer us. So for the Seven of Wands, meaning of the case in the normal position. One, confront the obstruction and take courage. Two, difficulty to overcome. Over, overcome your worries yourself. Three, internal conflicts with the workplace, school, or group. A scandal lurking inside. Folk remedies. Special treatment methods such as psychic healing. Chinese herbal medicine. Do not rely on modern medicine. Use acupuncture, moxibustion, etc. I don't know what moxibustion is. I'll have to look that one up too. Uh, in the case of the reverse, one, there is a hindrance. It, it'll be late. Things are going down. Two, be isolated. We will give up. I can't make an effort. Three, get caught up in strange knowledge. Be superstitious. Four, harmful med medicine smoking cannabis. So, um, and I guess we can see some of these things about, you know, being defensive or overcome your worries, stand your ground, that kind of thing, tied in with the traditional meaning of the Seven of Wands in the RWS. So uh, for the Eight, we have uh, the meaning in the normal position. Um, things move rapidly. Uh, things develop. Sudden things. Uh, urgent needs. An express letter, a telegram, a sudden phone call. High-speed vehicle. Air travel. Great hope get closer to the goal, large overseas trip, a big adventure, uh, do it early, become a member of a society soon, hope for an early marriage. So all things to do with speed, efficiency, you know, quick results, that kind of thing. Um, and also travel, which I associate wands with travel um, as well. So that, that kind of works for me. In the case of the reverse position, we have intense behavior, do it too fast, uses energy quickly, uh, lost to a strong opponent, discord, dissonance, suffer, being late, a stagnant event, uh, fluctuation, take turns, uh, being lazy, not being contacted by someone, um, not getting a reply to something. So I guess, you know, even though none of this is something that really I would use in my own reading style, I can kind of understand through the automatic translation what they're getting at here, which is predominantly the RWS, you know, style of readings, even though the imagery is completely different and that, you know, I don't know how you would get from the imagery um, into those particular meanings of the cards. So in terms of, you know, linking the images on the cards with the book, um, I, I don't really think it's possible, um, which is actually a fault of a lot of, you know, tarot books today, um, quite frankly. So <laughs> in that in that regard, not much has changed in some cases. Um, 
but yeah, it is, it is weird. Um, no, we had, we, we talked about sort of weird body shapes and things and faces in the uh, majors in this deck. And I think into the court cards, they actually used uh, photographs of people and um, may have manipulated those. So I think here, while some of the faces are a little bit disturbing or strange, um, to me, the bodies and the proportions seem a lot more normal. Um, and she actually reminds me of an actress and I've been trying to think of who, um, a modern actress, I've been trying to think of who that is. Uh, but anyway, I also get sort of games, Game of Thrones or like, um, you know, Lord of the Rings kind of vibes from some of these folks, just the way their hair is. We got the heavy mustaches and things like that. All right, we'll go on to our chalice suit and I have a little bit more translation for you. As we get to the five and six, here we have a lotus and a, a floating... Uh, sun or red orb. On our two, we have a seagull and a floating chalice over the sea. Three, we have a rose. Another floating chalice, this time at night or sunset or fire of hell, I have no idea. <laughs> I guess we'd have to read the book. Uh, six, we have, uh, five, sorry, we have kind of a um, forest kind of background here and then a pink candle. And then six, I really like this card actually. Um, it's kind of a spooky, um, you know, November or October scene um, with the silhouette, the trees have lost their leaves they're in silhouette and we have a witch flying on a broom in front of a full moon here. So that's just, you know, for all your, I don't know, occult stereotypes or <laughs> whatever, it's kind of cool. Um, so let's look at the, the translation here for the five and the six. So for the five, we have meaning in the case of a normal position, the sadness of love, disillusionment, uh, a drop of dissatisfaction. The lover leaves, I don't understand. I can't give up, unexplored regret, uh, getting sick of what you've done, trying to achieve the purpose by some method, resentment and jealousy. And then um, in the case of the reverse position, joy comes back, you meet an old friend, reunion with an old lover, uh, a return, finally love can be understood, talking to each other, getting freedom, discarding your commitment, a new relationship can be found, and new hobbies in play. Okay, so from, you know, sadness, disappointment, not understanding something to um, dealing with sadness, dealing, move on, uh, dealing with regret, moving on from a bad situation or a disappointment. Okay, great, you know, that's pretty classical five of cups kind of stuff. Um, for the six, we have uh, the meaning in the case of a normal position is about children, a childish dream. Um, an elementary school. Now, what any of this has to do with a flying witch, I don't know. You know, again, it doesn't, it's like the book was written with um, the RWS in front of the person and the cards were completely designed by somebody else. Um, but anyway, uh, nostalgic for the past, happiness for the past, children's things, um, the place I spent when I was a child, the first love. And then uh, in the reverse position, we have... Uh, infantile behavior hindering progress, being scared, um, relying on people, meeting with boring people, a boring club or circle, uh, presence related to the past, homes and schools when I was a child who didn't get better. So, you know, thinking about bad things that happened to us in our past that didn't improve uh, would be like a reverse position of, of the six of cups in the RWS, possibly not in this deck, but that's all right. seven with um looks like astral water pouring out in front of uh, the milky way and some other stars and planets eight we have an, a blue triangle inverted blue triangle above a kind of autumnal scene nine we have an upright red triangle in front of a blue sky 
tin, we have a turquoise cross over a pink and orange background. And then we have our quartz here. We've got the page, the knight. Very 70s. Doesn't he look like a like a 70s cult self-help guy, right? Like, would you want to join his cult? I would not. I would probably run away. Uh, this woman's interesting. She's got a crystal ball and she's got her sort of fortune telling outfit on here, her layered clothing and her big chunky jewelry. Now this king of chalices is very weird. Um, both, pace, both faces, particularly the child's face. It's just, yeah, not quite. So I don't, I don't know if this one's based on a picture or if this is from the artist's uh, own imagination. Um, now here we get into the, sor the suit of um, Athames, um, but it's called two different things. And I think it's funny because we have you know, indecision or bad proofreading um, from the publisher. Here's our two with the two, um, the red and black handle with the snakes. And I'm sure this has some ceremonial significance. Somebody who uh, maybe practices um, the style of witchcraft could tell me what a red and black handle might be used for. Here we have the three of Athames with a book with uh, Jewish um, Hebrew writing on the front. So ostensibly a Torah or maybe a book on the Kabbalah. More likely a book on the Kabbalah, frankly. Uh, four of Athames, we have a step pyramid in the background. Five, we have a, this looks like it's over the sea, so I'm gonna call that a hurricane. Six of Athames with a comet. Seven of Athames with a, a mountain scene with a storm. I don't know why, but this is reminding me of the movie Evil Dead, if you've seen that one. Eight of Athames with a um, Neolithic stone sculpture, part of Stonehenge or something in the background. Nine of Athames with a ceremonial doll and kind of a rainbow background. I like that background actually. It looks like rainbows and bubbles. 10 of Athames, more storms, lots of lightning. And this looks like lava coming out of a volcano. And now we have the page of what? <laughs> what suit are we in? Uh, page of Swords. Knight of Swords, Queen of Athames. Wait, what suit are we in? I don't know. I'm so confused. Um, her face is super creepy. Look at those eyes. She definitely looks like she's taken too many drugs and maybe had some some bizarre plastic surgery uh, to boot. Don't know. Definitely wouldn't want to meet her in a dark alley. And then the King of Wait, what? Swords? We're back to swords. Okay, great. All right, so let's try some court cards here. So for our queen, we have uh, a revolutionary, a woman with radical thoughts, a unique woman, a woman who lives in work rather than marriage. <laughs> I hate men. <laughs> a woman with no sex appeal. Wow, really harsh. Yeah, power, powerful women aren't sexy. That's That's probably still a convention held by many people, actually, unfortunately. Um, unique occupation, a foreigner, live strong overseas, a wandering life, I can't get a regular job, a way of life with many secrets, endless romance. So very a very bizarre mishmash of themes there. Um, and that's all in the upright position. So that's the, that's the good side of this card. Uh, in the reverse position, we have an evil woman, duh, um, a woman who commits a crime, uh, betrayal, brutality, lack of common sense, can't keep up with my parents, um, I guess disappointment to her family, a widow <clears throat> of a woman who broke up with her lover, someone who is mourning, um, 
and this card can in indicate future losses and waste caused by, caused by sad events and spouses. Okay, uh, for our king, in a normal position refers to a middle-aged man, a noisy type, a ruler, a one-man manager, a stubborn father, uh, self, someone involved in self-defense defense forces, um, a police officer, a judge, a guard, so that's pretty standard. Uh, push your thoughts onto others, being able to finish your work, holding down the opponent, a strong execution power. I think we mean in terms of executive power, right? A CEO type, uh, a scary existence for the enemy. In the reverse position, we have a dangerous person, a bad man, a violent man, Yakuza, so that's um, Japanese mafia, an extortionist, a charlatan, parents who use violence against their children, um, someone who makes conspiracies, uh, bad things caused in the past, injury, accident, someone causing trouble or being isolated. So not completely out of whack with, again, with the RWS meetings. Um, I'm a little salty about how badly they're treating our queen, our queen of swords, but again, um, sexism runs through many, many things in many time periods. So not exactly surprising. All right, we'll get through the rest of our uh, suits here. I don't have any other translation for you, um, <clears throat> just to make sure that this video doesn't become five hours long. But hopefully, uh, I, you know, I gave you some, I gave you a major, I gave you some pip cards, and I gave you some, uh, one example of the court cards. So hopefully that's, you know, well-rounded. Pentacles um, aren't much different from our other pips. We have, you know, variation in color. Sometimes we get sort of a landscape behind. Um, occasionally we get these silhouetted figures, but not very many. Um, and this deck would be tricky for me to read with in that way. Like, let's say we threw the book out, right? We didn't want to read this in an RWS style because it doesn't have the same imagery. So we wanted to kind of make up meanings based on the pictures. Um, that would be pretty, pretty challenging, I think. What are you going to do with a shark? Um, I don't know. Uh, here's four seagulls sitting on a pentacle rather than one seagull with uh, something else that we saw earlier in the deck. Is that significant to you? Um, the nine kind of hints at the RWS, we have this very fancy iron, uh, wrought iron gate. So you can imagine that there's a luxurious garden behind the gate. Um, we don't actually see that, it's just sort of hinted at. Ten of Pentacles, we get the archway in the traditional RWS Ten of Pentacles, but we don't get any of the people or the scene. And then here is our page. Our knight with ferns. Our queen and our king. He also looks like he's out of the Hobbit or Game of Thrones or something like that. Um, here are the backs. I didn't show you those before. And they do, sh they look, I don't know, Luna said they looked sort of Egyptian to her. I'm thinking like Aztec temple, maybe. Um, although now that I look at that, this is probably a sphinx. So face, here we go. And here's a paw. And this is like the headgear that's usually on them. So yeah, I'll go, I'll go Egyptian as well. Um, and we did see a hint, you know, here and there of other Egyptian uh, objects and, and scenes, desert scenes. So I guess that ties in. Still, very weird back. Very weird deck. Uh, what did you think? Um, do you know this deck? Have you ever seen it before? Um, what did you think of it? Uh, yeah, let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear your opinions um, or if you have any additional facts. Um, I will link to those two, um, the Alchemy website as well as the Collectic uh, Terra Forum websites that I mentioned before um, so that you can read those for yourself. Um, but again, there's not a ton of information about this deck out there. So um, if you have any more details, let me know. 
Otherwise, I'd just like to say thank you for joining me for this uh, really bizarre walkthrough and uh, having a look at the Tarot of Wicca with me. Um, tune in next time for more tarot. Hopefully I'll have something interesting for you. And until then, be well. Thanks.